We all know trout can see your fly, but did you know they can feel it too? Every trout has a built-in sixth sense that picks up the tiniest movements and vibrations in the water. It's called the lateral line, and today we're going to explore this hidden superpower and how you can use it to your advantage when fishing. The lateral line runs down each side of a trout and across its head. It's made up of tiny sensors called neuromasts, which detect even the faintest changes in water movement and pressure. The trout's lateral line is so sensitive that in the right conditions, it can detect a struggling insect on the surface or another trout swimming by without ever seeing it. Think of it like underwater hearing combined with touch. It allows a trout to interpret its environment without actually touching an object. Here's your first big takeaway. For the lateral line sense to work, either the fish, the object it is detecting, or both must be moving. Normally, our flies have neither sound nor smell. We can only rely on sight and vibration to attract the trout to our flies, and vibration requires movement. Trout use this system to find prey, avoid predators, navigate in the darkness, and even hold position in moving water. Inside each neural mast are hair cells covered by a gel-like cap called a cupula. When water moves, it pushes the cupula, bending the hair cells and sending signals straight to the trout's brain. There are two types of neural mast. Superficial neural masts are smaller and located on the exterior of the trout, on the skin or scales, primarily on the head around the eyes and jaw of the trout. Canal neuromasts are larger and located in a bony canal that runs the length of the trout from the gills to the tail. This canal is located beneath the skin and scales on a trout. Pores along the side of the trout leave this canal open to the surrounding water. In other words, water flows into and out of the canal through these pores. Essentially, the lateral line allows trout to feel their surroundings, even the tiniest movement in the water. When you move through the water, even if you're being super stealthy, you create pressure waves. A trout might not see you, but it can feel that something is there. The lateral line doesn't send out signals like sonar. It just receives signals created by motion. Because of their size and location, the two different types of neuromast respond to different frequencies. Wait, frequencies? Yes, frequencies. When we hear sound, what we are actually responding to is changes in pressure in the air or pressure waves. Tiny hairs within your ear detect these changes. Pressure waves travel much further and faster under the water than they do above the surface. You may not realize it, but the speed of sound increases under the water. Sound can travel four to five times faster under the surface of the water. When something moves in the water, or the water moves around something, it creates low-frequency vibrations. And the trout's lateral line is tuned to these frequencies. This helps explain the trout's lightning-quick reflexes. Even the tiny pressure waves created by a struggling caddis nymph a few inches from the trout can be felt almost instantly. For trout, the lateral line is mostly a close-range detection system. Typically, the range is about one body length. And while the lateral line system can be incredibly sensitive to vibrations created by movement, conditions matter. In general, larger objects can be detected further away than smaller objects. A trout might be able to detect a minnow at a distance of 18 inches, but a struggling nymph might only be detected at a distance of 3 or 4 inches. Calm water makes it easier to pick up subtle vibrations while flowing rivers create background noise. Scientists think that the canal neuromass actually help filter out some of that noise so trout can differentiate between less important noises created by rocks or current, for example, and more important noises, like bait fish. But there's still a difference between water types. So that fly that kills it in still water? Sometimes it might not perform the same in the current of a river. And that's not your imagination. It's biology. By now, you know we love to blow your mind with fishing-related science. Sound, or pressure waves, work by moving molecules. 
The pressure waves created by sound cause molecules to bump into each other, moving the molecules. The denser the material, the more molecules there are. More molecules mean the molecules are closer together, so they don't have to move as far to bump into each other. It's kind of like these beads. If they're scattered with some distance between them, and I move this cup representing a sound wave into the beads, not much happens. But if the beads are tightly packed when I move the cup, well, now I'm picking up beads for the next week. So pressure waves travel further and faster underwater because water is denser. Makes sense, right? Here comes the fun part. Many anglers that frequently fish dirty water swear that larger flies that push more water work better. The water is dirty because it has more particles in it. More particles means more molecules. The flies are pushing water and in turn pushing the molecules, which are more tightly spaced than they would be in clear water. The end result is that the flies move more molecules and can be detected from further away. In a sense, the flies feel louder to the trout in dirty water. But here's the catch. Everything in the dirty water will feel louder to the trout's lateral line. Regardless of size, everything feels louder, from waves to rocks to streamers and even tiny nymph flies. Everything's louder. And just like with vision, when a trout sees the fly, there are no guarantees the trout will take the fly. Just because a trout is more aware of a loud fly in dirty water doesn't always mean the trout will seek out the fly. Of course, trout can feel the fly in clear water as well, but given a choice, trout are primarily sight hunters. So in clear water, appeal to the eyes. But in off-color water, you may want to appeal to the lateral line first and the eyes second. Trout are masters at reading their environment. They can sense ripples from a fallen insect, detect direction and distance of moving prey, and even notice sudden panic in the water. This ability also helps them hold position in fast currents and conserve energy. They don't instinctively know to hold on the bottom or hide behind rocks. They feel the flow and use it to their advantage. You look at a river and see flow. A trout feels architecture. Behind a rock is not safety, it's geometry in motion. A pulse, a repeating pattern of spinning vortices, invisible but perfectly rhythmic, like the river breathing in slow motion. And trout don't just notice it, they enter it. The lateral line locks onto the rhythm. They aren't so much swimming as they are surfing. The river is holding them in place like a hand. But here's the part that almost nobody knows. They still need their eyes to confirm the rock's distance. Feel gives them energy. Vision gives them geometry. And when the sun goes down and the light vanishes, they don't stay behind the rock. They slide to one side of it. Because in darkness, they rely more on their lateral line to tell them what they can't see. And while the flow on the side of the rock may not save as much energy, it's easier to surf using just the lateral line. So if you hunt them at night, stop fishing behind the rock. Fish the side and have the discipline to try both sides because studies have shown that the majority of trout prefer one side over the other. Fishing in dirty water is very similar. Whether it's dirty water or it's after the sun has gone down, either way the trout's vision is limited and they have to rely on their other senses. In this case, we're talking about the lateral line. So look for trout in the same places, on the sides of the rock instead of behind the rock. Now that we better understand the lateral line and how trout use it, how can we use this information as anglers? Simple. We appeal to movement. Most days, I deliberately move my flies. I twitch them, animate them, make them feel alive. Why? Because movement creates vibrations the lateral line can detect. Even a dead drift isn't really dead. Our flies get pulled by currents and swirls, but they can only travel so far before their tippet leash pulls them back. Subtle motion is inevitable. A live insect struggles, fights the current, thrashes in short bursts. By animating your flies in the same way, you mimic real prey. 
you distinguish your flies from thousands of other bits of junk and debris a trout sees drifting in the current every minute. This is not to say that a good dead drift isn't important. Without a good dead drift, your flies are all over the place, and any motion you impart is accidental and probably unnatural. So you need to master the dead drift. Only then can you make the motion intentional. When we're talking about animating flies, we're talking about very small, subtle movements. While nymphing, this can be accomplished by gently twitching the rod tip, manipulating your mens, lifting line or laying line on the water, adjusting the angle of a tight line or euro nymphing rig, or changing the rate at which you recover slack or strip line. Now, you might think I'm crazy for saying this, but sometimes on a dry fly, you move it. I know, I thought the same thing, until an older gentleman showed me a subtle trick. He didn't drag it. He didn't skate it. He gently took up a tiny bit of slack in the leader. He made it quiver, barely, like a mayfly remembering it's alive. It's not just for the trout's eyes. The lateral line feels the tiniest pulse. That quiver whispers, something's alive here. And suddenly the trout's curiosity trumps caution. The trick is patience. Don't force it. Don't overthink it. Just let the fly speak in barely their pulses and watch the trout respond. The key, gentle, patient, deliberate. Let the fly speak and watch the trout respond. Scale matters too. Small prey like midges move one to two inches per second, while larger prey like minnows might move four to six inches per second. Your animation should match the size and speed of the prey you're imitating. Short, subtle, natural. Every fly creates a unique hydrodynamic fingerprint as it moves through the water, a pattern of vibrations that trout can feel. Even small differences in materials, hook style, or bead size can completely change how a fly feels underwater. That's why a hot fly can suddenly stop producing after it's replaced. The replacement may look similar to us, but it might move differently and feel different in the water. Its acoustic profile may be different. This is why precision and fly tying matters. Strive for consistency. Follow the recipe exactly. Count the fibers, measure the beads, match the weight. Trout can notice even the smallest differences. The lateral line is finely tuned and consistency is key. I can't speak for every fly fishing channel you might watch, but here at Troutwise, we try to be precise in our fly tying videos. A size 18 hook that's 9 millimeters long with exactly 3 pheasant tail fibers and a 2.5 millimeter bead that weighs 10 centigrams, and so on and so forth. We've tested our flies. We know what works and what doesn't. If you substitute materials and change the acoustic profile, well, that's on you, not on us. The lateral line gives trout a picture of the world we can't see, a world made of waves, pulses, and pressure changes. When we understand that world, we can more effectively present our flies to the trout. So next time you're on the water, remember this. Trout don't just see your fly, they can feel it coming. Subtle movement, careful animation, and attention to detail in your flies can make all the difference. Fish smarter, tie better, think like a trout. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.